Hello, my fellow forgiven sinners. Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week, we talked about living for our heavenly house rather than for our earthly tent, that the world and everything in it is temporary and headed for death. It doesn't last, but the things of God do last, and therefore, they are far more valuable. Today we continue the section that we started last week, uh, and here the Apostle Paul expounds on what it looks like to live for heavenly things rather than for earthly things. We'll start by reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 21, uh, the second half of that chapter that we started last week. There it says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore... All died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. From now, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might receive the righteousness of God. This is God's word. Our first words in this section speak of the compelling love of Christ. Think about the things that motivate you. Some of those motivations are good, some of them are evil. Some of those motivations in our lives we're proud of. Others we're kind of ashamed of, right? We're moved by, uh, we're we're moved to actions uh, by our needs and by our wants, by the actions of other people, by how we feel in a given moment, and so on and so forth. But Paul says that the gospel gives us a new motivation that is far greater than all others. We are motivated now by the love of Christ. God laid aside his heavenly glory in order to die in our place and rise again and to forgive us of our sins and to save us from death and hell so that we are now looking forward to an, uh, to eternal glories with him in heaven. What else could mean more to us than that? Paul goes on to explain the gospel in a fascinating way. He says, one died for all and therefore all died. Think about the impact death has on us. We fear death. We put so much stock in the things that we want to do before we die. But Paul says, actually, we've been there. We've done that. (laughs) We died with Christ, he says. There's an ancient church with this inscription on it. It says, those who die before they die will not die when they die. That's a bit of a mouthful. Let's walk through it just for a moment. It says, those who die through baptism, as in we die with Christ, just as Paul is saying here, those who die with Christ in this way, before they die physically, will not die eternally when they die physically. Those who die before they die will not die when they die. You see what Paul is saying here? You died with Christ, and you have been raised to a new life. Therefore, you are no longer trapped by death like the rest of the world. You no longer have to fear it. You're no longer stuck waiting for this death to come. You've been there. You've done that. You are set free from it. Paul continues. He says, And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Here I'm reminded of the Count of Monte Cristo. It's a a fascinating picture if you've never read it. I'd, I'd encourage it. It's a very interesting story. But in the story, the main character, Dante, saves a man's life. And the man is so grateful that he dedicates his life to serving Dante. The man figures that his life would have been over uh, if Dante hadn't saved him. And so, whatever time he has left 
therefore belongs to Dante's. In a very similar way, you and I would have been dead without Jesus. Not only physically, but also spiritually, eternally. We would be lost in death and hell. But Jesus died to save us. Paul says, don't waste your life on yourself anymore. Instead, whatever time you and I have left belongs to Jesus. In verse 16, Paul says uh, something rather fascinating. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Think about the ways that we regard or judge people. We judge others by how they look, by their status, by their perceived wealth or importance, by uh, how they treat us, or by how we see them treating other people. Again, the list goes on and on. But generally, we judge people by how uh, they make us feel, by what they do for us. Does this person help me or hurt me? Does this person make me feel good or feel bad? It's sort of an inherently selfish way that we regard one another, isn't it? Unfortunately, this creeps in even to our closest and most loving relationships. We still treat each other according to uh, selfish means and methods. Paul says we once judged Jesus in this way. Some just look at Jesus as a great teacher with ideas that we can either take or leave at our whims. Others regard Jesus as God, but they just want to still use Jesus in order to get what they want. We try to use Jesus to our own ends, but Paul says we don't do this anymore. Now we regard uh, Jesus as our Lord and Master. We aim to serve him rather than using him for what we want. We want to see how we can uh, be used for the good of Christ, for what Jesus wants for us and for the world around us. Our view of Christ teaches us not only to look at ourselves in this new way, but also to look at others in this new way too. As we aim to serve Jesus, we no longer look at others as tools to get what we want from them. Instead, we recognize other people as loved by God just as we are loved by God. Jesus died for them just as he died for us. Furthermore, Jesus has commanded us to love others just as we love ourselves. Therefore, we look for how we can serve others just as Christ has served us rather than how they can serve us, rather than using other people to get what we want. In verse 17, Paul says that everyone in Christ is a new creation. Our old worldly motivations, our worldly and selfish way of regarding each other, those are a thing of the past. They have been, we, we have been made new in Jesus. I remember an old Southern Christian who struggled with alcoholism for many years. Uh, when he came to Christ, he said, that old way of life is dead to me. It's no longer who I am. And this is how we can now look at all of our sins. When we died with Christ, our worldly and selfish life died right there and then. Now we are made new. Raised to a new life in Jesus where we live according to God's will and God's ways. Where we do what is right rather than what is wrong. When we do fall into sin again, what do we do? We confess those sins to our God and to one another. And we live in the new forgiveness that Christ has won for us. We continue now in this new life that he has given us. In verses 18 through 19, Paul speaks about reconciliation. One of the most painful experiences in life is when a close relationship is shattered. Generally, that happens because of sin. Uh, even, again, in very loving relationships, we can treat each other very selfishly and we can hurt one another. Suddenly, a relationship that was once filled with love suddenly is injected with hatred. It's confusing, it's painful, but sometimes those relationships, broken as they may be, can actually be mended. They can be put back together. That's reconciliation. The two find a way to heal through the wounds and to continue loving each other. When a broken relationship is put back together, this is what Paul means by the word reconciliation. Paul is saying you and I had a broken relationship with God. God made us for a perfect relationship with him, but by our sin, we made ourselves God's enemies. We had worked against him. We had allied ourselves with Satan and with death. But God crossed the bridge that we had burned by forgiving our sins through the death and resurrection of Jesus. His unfathomable sacrifice to forgive us has healed our relationship with him. God has bent over backwards to win us back, not because he gets something out of it, not because he can use us for his own means or for his own ends, but instead because he simply is love. 
And that is what love does. It sacrifices for the good of another. Now here I want to make an important uh, nuance, an important point. Notice what Paul is saying. That God's love leads us toward repentance and lives that serve him rather than that continue to serve ourselves. Yes, God is self-giving. He is self-sacrificing. But God's self-sacrificing love for us is not meant to enable us to continue living in our sin. In fact, that would not be loving at all if God simply uh, helped us and empowered us to continue doing evil, to continue serving ourselves. It would be evil for us to abuse God's grace by using it as an excuse to continue living for ourselves. In the same way, when you and I love one another, our aim is to help each other toward what is good. It is, it is not, it would not be loving for us to enable each other to continue in our sins, to continue doing what we should not. Many Christians uh, burn themselves out trying to love their neighbor, when in reality they are simply uh, endlessly giving of themselves so that somebody can continue to live in sin. And that's not really love. And that's one of the reasons why people do get burned out so much. This is a difficult nuance, but it's uh, absolutely vital for us to recognize as we aim to love each other just as Christ loved us. Paul says that God reconciled the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. This is the gospel message that God has forgiven us. Rather than treat us as our sins deserve by sending us to hell, God has removed our sins and granted us his grace, richly blessing us with the promise of of eternal life. Paul goes on in verses 19 to 20 to say that we have been uh, brought now into God's plan of salvation. We have been given this message of reconciliation to share with the world. Paul says that we are God's ambassadors. An ambassador does not live uh, his own uh, way, right? Instead, an ambassador recognizes that everything he does is going to represent the country that he is from. Uh, an ambassador has to be very careful what they say, what they do, because what they do will, again, reflect on that country, whether for good or for ill. You and I as Christians represent Christ. That name is on us, Christian, Christian, right? One of the common complaints against Christians today is that we are all hypocrites. Many Christians have not represented Christ well to the world. Take your life seriously. You have a high and holy calling, a responsibility to give God a good name by how you represent him to the world. Paul ends this section in a beautiful way with a fascinating description of the gospel. He writes, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus had no sin. He did nothing wrong at all. And yet he took responsibility for all of our evils. He took the punishment that our sin deserved, dying on the cross. And now, by his mercy, God attributes to us the perfect moral track record of Jesus. We have become the righteousness of God. And now, you and I have an opportunity with our lives right now to live that righteousness out by living no longer for ourselves, no longer in a worldly way, but to instead live for him who died for us and was raised again. It is worldly, it is normal to live selfishly. It is worldly and normal to treat others merely according to what we can get out of them. But Jesus died and rose that we might break out of this worldly cycle and instead live a godly life of serving others for their good, just as God has served us for our good. May God transform each of us by how he has mended our broken relationship with himself through the forgiveness of our sins. May God work in us the righteousness of Christ just as he has granted that moral track record to us through faith in Jesus. My dear friends in Christ, be reconciled to God in Christ through faith. Let Christ's love compel you. Live no longer in the worldly way, but in the way of Christ. Regard no one in a worldly way, but instead in the heavenly way of Jesus. Amen. I say, I say, can't be that easy. And he said, he said, and no, 